Hello, amazing visionaries. This is Lorna Liana, host of Emtheo Nation, and I'm here with two of my favorite visionary artists in the world, Alex and Allison Gray, who both have a distinct style that I am thrilled to understand in greater depth. Now, the mystic paintings of Alex Gray articulate realms of psychedelic visionary consciousness, revealing interwoven energies of body and soul, love and spirit, illuminating the anatomical core of each being. Alison Gray, MFA, is a painter, social sculptor, and is Alex's creative collaborator, life partner, and studio mate since art school in 1975. And she has an incredible way of uh, uh, channeling secret writing that I am so uh, intrigued to learn more about. So I've had the pleasure of attending numerous events where I witnessed both uh, Allison and Alex live painting to some of my favorite musicians like Spongel on the Mayan Riviera during my birthday, the winter solstice of 2012, and Emancipator during Bicycle Day in 2015. So I'm so excited to hear more about um, your work and how visionary states have influenced um, uh, your, your path as um, spiritual beings and as artists. So thank you so much for joining us today, Allison and Alex. Thanks for having us. Hey, thanks uh, for asking us. And um, Yeah, so I'd love to hear more about your background um, and how you came to create the art that you do today. Who would like to take that? <laughs> We've been together for 41 years, sharing a studio. So that's longer than our life apart. You know, it's about like almost twice as long as our life apart. So we grew up very, you know, in different places. Alex grew up in Columbus, Ohio. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. And we met in art school in 1974 in a class that was called Conceptual Mixed Media. And so Alex and I met on the level of conceptual mixed media. And what does that mean? That means that it starts with an idea. Art is an idea. And mixed media means it can be made of anything. And for us, art is life. So we are both painters as well. We've always been painters. We grew up as artists. Alex was a very successful high school artist, and so was I. And then we went to art school. That's what happens when you're a successful. You meet up with all the other successful uh, artists from, from their youth. And uh, so we've traveled on a path where we have three bodies of work. We have Alex's paintings and sculpture. We have my paintings and sculpture. And we have our social sculpture, which is Cosm. The art is life church. <laughs> in the Hudson Valley, where, where building a temple is our mission. Wow, so you're, the, so you're building a temple together. Oh, we're building a temple with the community globally. We're building a temple with everyone who's helped us with our current Kickstarter campaign going on. We, we, all the people that have donated and bought things from Cosm, all of our work goes directly into building an enduring temple to uplift a global community. We've been everywhere. We've been to heaven. Yeah. Where have we been? Everywhere. Moscow. Australia. Sao Paulo. Yeah. Uh, Mexico. Santiago, Mexico yeah. City. Yeah. We yeah. saw you outside of Tulum, right? Uh-huh. Wow, so that's so interesting. So I, I can't wait to dive into uh, this co-creative uh, um, this co-creative vision that you are manifesting. Uh, I'd like to also uh, get a little bit of an understanding of you know your individual works of art. So you know, Allison, can you tell me um, uh, how have the visionary states influenced your art? Because when I see the secret writings that come through, it seems like it's really coming from a whole other place altogether. So I'd love to understand what that is. It is true. Uh, my work is comprised of three basic elements, chaos, order, and secret writing. And chaos, order, and secret writing, you know, is an essentialized worldview that came to me through successive LSD and probably some psilocybin experiences, but prim primarily LSD experiences from the time I was uh, 20. Um, I mean, I was tripping when I was 17, but when I was 20, I had a spiritual awakening in my LSD trip where I saw secret writing washing over all surfaces and ribboning through the air as light. So here we were, uh, 
you know, sort of bracketed and, 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 uh, and all things defined by symbols. It was, they were just infinite symbols that were sacred, but unpronounceable and ineffable. And that was my experience that sent me to uh, a, a, a engagement with xenolinguistics, as my friend Diana Slattery would say, the psychedelics and language that came to me. So in any case, I um, made my art about that for my you know, thesis, and I continued to make art with secret writing. But chaos and order, chaos is order plus entropy. Order, in my art, represents this interconnectedness of all beings and things, that mandalic fountain and drain of energy that we all are. And we interconnect with everyone. Then there's chaos, which is order plus entropy, which means everything is beautifully falling apart. All the spectrums of color and particles and waves, and, you know, they're all breaking up beautifully in our material world. So that's the material world. There's the spiritual world of light and bliss. And then there's the secret writing. There's the, the way we communicate, what thoughts we have that become things. All the thoughts that become creative. That's where our creativity, creative expression is. So as, a, as an artist, I'm a symbol maker. And so chaos order and, and secret writing uh, came to me as, a, as, as my conceptual and universal worldview that I have been committed to and will always be committed to making art about. But we've always felt that we were making art about the same thing, have we not, my darling? Absolutely. Well, as Allison was pointing out, each artist has a creative language, a kind of secret language through which they're communicating something that can't be communicated by words alone. And so the uh, subject of light and uh, the, the unpronounceable mystery of things are elements that are woven into uh, my artwork, absolutely. And I think that I come at it from a iconic, more Christianized, if you would, uh, religious perspective, Allison, from a more uh, a Jewish and iconic tradition. It's, uh, there's a kind of an edict about trying to represent God in the flesh, in a way. And Edict against it. Against it, you know. And, and, and Yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, these are uh, really, I, I think, uh, God, to my mind, is, uh, I think, everything that exists. And uh, so God embodies and is never limited by any embodiment. And so... I have no illusions about the, the limitation of God to an embodiment. I'm just saying that God also manifests through embodiment. And that's the more iconic and that's the more figurative tradition that I'm attempting to use really as symbol systems to speak of the unspeakable, to portray the unportrayable. Uh, which is the light that runs through us, the consciousness that we can't see, that we're animated by and listening through, but uh, have no symbol to really represent. Consciousness itself is a tremendous mystery. It's the ultimate mystery. It's what the evolutionary life force of creativity that's moving through each one of us, you know, as us, you know, we feel that force of life that is breathing through us, but there's only one of us here, ultimately. And that is the one God self that is networked through all beings. And so if we are an ingot of this, you know, kind of incandescent creative force sparking into 
the material and leaving the impression of consciousness, leaving the slime like a slug leaves across a rock, but instead it's consciousness leaving the slime of paint or of sculpture or of something that, that these are the traces of human consciousness that weave us back into distant history. Right. You know, art is the ultimate religion because it contains all religions. All religions used creative expression or else we would never know about them. And so they always will. And even people who have no interest in religion at all are expressing themselves through creative action. They can't do anything else. That's human nature. And so if your religious orientation were about something so innate to humanity, like creativity, creativity is pure contact with creative spirit in each one of our lives. And if we're doing something creative that's from our soul, we feel good about it. You know, that this is something good uh, personally. You know, it's something I need to do. I was born to do. Mm -hmm. That's the feeling that, that creative people have when they're really activating that creative principle in themselves. And so uh, I felt in touch with a visionary reality and then my mission as an artist really came online. But my focus prior to that was the subject of mortality and the nature of the self. So all of these elements I feel like go together very well and are a very philosophical orientation to making art. It's not a popular position. I'm Mistake. <laughs> it was just what I was driven to, and I think I was driven to it because I was a visionary artist in my prior lifetime, and I believe I'm continuing on a similar orientation to visionary reality, and just being, you know, one of the spokes monkeys for the, you know, visionary realm, and saying we need to uh, connect back with this superior uh, ideal realm that the philosophers built Western civilization on and has only been demonized uh, because of the anti-sacramental attitude mm -hmm. of the Judeo-Christian, uh, you know, takeover of religion. And so what's happening now with the reintroduction of psychedelics and Sorry, I don't think you're going to put that genie back in the bottle. <laughs> the hallucinogenie is out, has left the building, and is wide across the world. And so uh, it's the entheo nation transcends all nations, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and incorporates and uh, infiltrates and is the underground mycelial. Uh, web work of all nations. So uh, I I think that humanity is waking up. It's a treacherous and a exciting time to be alive. And I think that the arts can have an impact and these shows and everything can have an impact on just empowering people to say uh, we're a we're a tribe, we're a community that transcends nations. And the family of light and love is uh, connecting through creative expression. This is why I say that it's a global community that building the temple. Mm -hmm. Just Alex and I, Alex and I had the vision simultaneously uh, on our first MDMA experience uh, in 1985 that we were going to build a temple. That's how that started. We had already been together since 1975, but uh, 10 years later, we had our first MDMA experience lying on our bed, and we envisioned that it was our duty as artists. And it was like the, the greatest challenge that a spiritual artist could have would be to build a temple that they would leave for the, for the community of the future. You know, so uh, we 
didn't know how we were going to go about that, but that was our quest. And then in 1996, Chapel of Sacred Mirrors became a nonprofit organization. And then in 2008, Chapel of Sacred Mirrors Cosm became a church, an interfaith, radically welcoming interfaith church. So um, this is, you know, uh, a creation that we initiated uh, but it would not be happening if it weren't for many, many, many artists and creative people. Thousands of creative people from around the world. Yeah, because this is a creative center where we're talking to you from is in uh, Wappinger, New York. at 65 miles from New York City. And uh, there's a really widespread, you know, driving community, easy access community to the center where, you know... Uh, you know, we do a lot of music, dance, art, uh, in a spiritual um, in a spiritual setting, for one thing. It's absolutely gorgeous here. It's 40 wooded acres. It's so beautiful. And we have a big guest house and like that. So anyway, that's what, that's what we're doing. So people can go and visit your center and participate in workshops and retreats. That's right. And we have, we have held full moon ceremonies for th over thir 13 and a half years. 164 consecutive and unbroken chain of full moon ceremonies. And then we have our equinoxes, solstices, and our church. So we have certain formats and people come and make art together, or they dance, or they make music, or they listen to music. Wow, I would love to come visit sometime. That sounds amazing. And I think it's so beautiful that you, uh, you know, this, uh, this, um, initial vision emerged so many years ago. So uh, back in, uh, was it 1985 when you had the shared MDMA vision to create a temple together? Was what is behind you? Was Did you see that or did that yeah. emerge over time? This is the second temple. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, see, we, ha we had a, an initial uh, vision of the sacred mirrors in a round room. Mm -hmm. That was, a, uh, I, there's only one on my desk, you know. All right, but, I'm gonna go uh, get it on there right now. Yeah. And, and uh, for, uh, for me, I, uh, we always saw it in a round room and we had a sense of multiple shapes that would be involved you know, but we always kept wondering, well, what is the thing going to look like on the outside? We just didn't know. And then on Allison's birthday, uh, back in 2007, I had a vision of, of this uh, temple. Here's the doorway over here. Yeah. That reminds me of the stupa at Baudinoth in Nepal. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's, very, it's very, very much like a stupa. But uh, one of the things that distinguishes it is you can kind of see uh, an outline of here's a nose, and then a here's a lips, and then here's like uh, the uh, chin. the chin. Now I don't know whether whether you yeah, can you line, hold it whether I can line it up and you can see these elements. But what it uh, has is basically two profiles that are connected at the forehead. They're kind of leaning in toward each other, but mm -hmm. they're also the shape of uh, this. And you can see this by the, uh, the different heads that have a similar uh, temple shape between them. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Wow. Fascinating. So each one of those heads uh, has a temple shape between it. And then they have another little te littler temple shape between that. So it's like a fractal... Uh, piece of architecture made by beings within beings and ultimately the nature field becomes the outer being of this uh, lotus-like uh, form. It's in honor of the divine feminine and it's the womb that we'll uh, place the sacred mirrors in uh, and Allison's work if we're able to uh, be successful with Entheon We'll move our works out of Antheon and move them into this ultimate chapel of sacred mirrors that would be in our meadow in the field. But that's many years in the future, maybe a decade from well, now even. What we what we had when we moved to uh, this place was six buildings and a barn. 
So we've been restoring each building one at a time because it was very compromised, all the buildings. And this structure is being built around an 1882 carriage house. We're basically repurposing and transforming the carriage house into a visionary sanctuary. And um, so anyway, there, when you go, when you come and visit us, you go in and you'll see how it wraps itself around the carriage house, the old carriage house, and we built in, into it. And it's three stories on one side and two on the other. It's on a hill. So, but anyway, it was an existing building and it was more um, in keeping with our community to repurpose an existing building than to start building a brand new building. So we're going to repurpose all the buildings on the property first, make them habitable and uh, really useful to the community, this being building number four. We've done three other buildings before this. One of them is a three-story Victorian guest house where you can come and stay, my Lana. <laughs> come and visit us. I can't us. wait. <laughs> That's what we wanted. We wanted, you know, to have a guest house. You know, I th you say the Judeo-Christian. I think it's the Abrahamic traditions. And Abraham, the first Jew, who also was the father of Islam, was the father of Ishmael, uh, as well as Isaac. But anyway, he was a... He was a... Uh, he had a lodge. He had a place where you could stop and stay, he had like a guest house. People would come there and he would talk about his God contact. So this temple, um, what, I'm a little bit confused by the different names. So there's Entheon, there's Cosm, there's the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. Well, so Cosm is a shortened uh, anagram for Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. It stands for Chapel of okay. Cosm. Okay. So Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, Cosm. And Entheon is the name of this, this structure here. It's the visionary art sanctuary. So it's like if you were to name your museum or your temple. It's Entheon. Alex came up with the name Entheon, which means... A place to discover the creator within. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Whenever I... Um, uh, try to describe what it's like to journey into the visionary state um, through the plant medicine that I work most uh, closely with, ayahuasca. Um, I basically direct people to your artwork, Alex, and say, okay, well, if somebody were to wander into my mind uh, in, you know, an ayahuasca ceremony and take a digital photo of what I see, it would most likely look like that. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, you know, for both of you, when you work with these visionary medicines, do you feel like the different medicines have a different effect on your art and that they're communicating to you as different beings? And what is that like for you? So like, Alex, you know, I sometimes think that I look at your art and I'm like, that's LSD and that's mescaline and that's definitely ayahuasca, but I could be wrong. So, you know, what, you're probably right. <laughs> you Alex, know, Alex I, does that about everybody else's art, too. Yeah, yeah. That was, you know, and as soon as Nana Thurman saw the uh, Bardo being, for instance, she said, tryptamines. <laughs> you, know, you know, it was like, uh, the DMT was like a uh, kind of shh, like steam coming off of that piece. and But that was through the uh, ayahuasca experiences that uh, I, there was a lady who wanted me to paint her portrait. And uh, I had never done ayahuasca before. It was, I think it was 2000 or something. We were talking about this. And I had been smoking DMT, though, for a while. And uh, so the, uh, the lady said, no, you got to do the ayahuasca because it really healed me, actually. I had a, you know, I went to Peru in a wheelchair and walked home, you know, uh, or walked back, you know. So uh, she regained uh, elements of her nervous system through the healing power of ayahuasca and said, you have to experience it. And so uh, that did lead to a whole new uh, experience of, of artwork. And that w directly was Net of Being, which came out as a Tool record album in 2006. 
And uh, is this, that the one with the eyes, the cosmic eyes, and it's the beings that are all interconnected. Their heads are connected with each other, and and oh, they're yeah, okay. They're made out of a web of um, uh, fire and eyes, basically, and a little galactic window inside of themselves. But they're all kind of uh, seamlessly welded together in an infinite network that is a. Uh, it's an X, Y, Z infinite network of these godheads, you know, and I, I experienced that as a space. And this is God, this is, yeah, this is God like, self. Yeah, this uh -huh. is it's called God self. It's on the cover of Net of Being, but it basically has that kind of uh, element and it shows the recession of them in space. So that was really the DMT experience that, that, led me to that uh, palace of uh, the infinite godheads. And I, it felt like that each one of us was like a node in this kind of infinite network of consciousness. And it was another way to start to imagine the network self, you know? Mm -hmm. And so with, um, with your art, Allison, the secret writing that comes through, do you have a sense of where that's coming from? Like, is it coming from a particular star system or a particular sure. dimension? Or do you ever see the beings that communicate that with you? Oh, I, okay. I have experienced beings, yes, in uh, DMT and ayahuasca. Um, I've experienced, uh, yeah, I think that's primarily where I experience beings. Uh, and, and I do tend to have a takeaway from all the psychedelic experiences that I have. I try to come back with something, you know, practical knowledge that I can use in my life. And I think often it lends to creativity. Uh, I could say that, you know, uh, in our, I mean, maybe a year and a half ago when we were tripping on LSD, I uh, was heard that I should uh, get out of my keyboard and start practicing piano again after 50 years. So I did. I, I hadn't practiced since I was 12, and I've been practicing for a year and a half. So I do think it, it lends to creativity, but I don't really see it as directly uh, a result in my art as Alex does. You know, when it comes to creativity, Alex writes about this in his book, Mission of Art. You know, for me, it, it's a little bit different the way I, I come up with my next images. I mean, it's like images come by Alex constantly, and he's always writing them down and notating them. There's like maybe, you know, 12 new drawings a day sometimes, you know, and, and ideas and in writing. To me, I like to let the river flow. I mean, because I'm working and focusing on a piece that I'm working on right now. So I try not to think too much about what it's going to be next. I do think a little bit. As I get close to the end of a, a really dedicated piece, like I just finished a piece that took me three years. Um, and then I'm now I'm doing pieces that are smaller so that I can do some sketches and things like that. But, um, you know, the work evolves one out of the other, and I wait for my ready time when I'm ready to think about my next piece, go to the river, pick out whatever sand may be coming down, if it's nice and juicy, and then I do that. So uh, we, we all have our different, uh, our different ways, right? Processes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's different for every artist, and that's one of the things that I find so fascinating. And one of the other reasons why I think it's a good thing to uh, bring the spirituality and uh, creativity together, because the, the, one of the things that we are most resistant to in religion is uh, dogmatism, you know. Like in you know, like a closed knowledge system. Like well, this is all the this is all the truth we have, and nothing else outside of it is truth. You know, you know. With artists, they want to continue to expand their body of work and evolve. Always, they're evolving their consciousness and their body of art. So, uh, likewise, we're always expanding in our knowledge. Like science is always growing. In, oh, we used to believe this. Now we understand we were flawed in our knowledge, and we've we since come to believe this. You know, it's always evolving, and so coming to a greater understanding. Uh, and so, 
I think that the religions of the future, or serious ones of today, would incorporate all of science. That all of science would be part of uh, that religious attitude because it's saying, this is the way God is manifesting in our world, as, we, as micro and as macro as we can understand it. This is the magnificent uh, expressing itself. You know, and we're able to uh, see this much of it. And now, through the miracle of visionary artists, you know, we're able to also see, because I'm only one of many visionary artists, you know, that are pointing to and really trying to articulate uh, the inner worlds of the, um, the ayahuasca state or the, uh, the state of these other uh, psychedelics. And they join a worldwide artistic tradition of attempting to uh, portray these dimensions. Mm. I think that in many ways it's our, uh, I don't know, inner, inner quest to um, make something beautiful out of religion, where religion has been so maligned and, and damaged by, by evil acts and sins and mm-hmm. unkindness and transgression. But that's not what religion is, and we don't want the fundamentalists to have the only use of that word. It's not fair that they get to use the word religion, where we have this wonderful community gathering together for uh, in favor of tolerance, difference, love, love, you know, uh, acceptance, acceptance of all paths to the divine, including a sacrament. So uh, what, what brings gender people balance. to gender balance, absolutely. That's why we're, you know, we want to be portrayed together, not because we always work together, because we work separately too, but because we want to be a stand you know, the visionary artists are, you know, I mean, there's a certain friendly competition, I suppose, to be good and to be better. But there's an incredible amount of collaboration going on with, you know, muraling. And a lot of visionary artists are really uh, being, a, being a model for, you know, cooperation, cooperation upwardly yeah. spiraling together. Mm-hmm. So what is your vision for Entheon and uh, the visionary community? Where do you see this going? <laughs> well, first we want to, you know, we're going basically according to the visions that we, uh, that are guiding us. You know, we find it astonishing that uh, we have gotten this far, really. You know, for two independent artists that just wanted to make art in their studio, and then got these visions that, no, it's a temple. What? You want us to build a temple? Oh, my God, how do you do that? We don't know, you know. But look, now today, in a world of social networking, where our tribe is basically transcontinental, and uh, in, in, in living rooms... Uh, uh, and and studios around the world, you know, people can contact us. Those of the tribe who care, you know, can be in contact, and if they want to, they can become part of an art project with us. If they connect with the artwork, if it means, if it relates to their sacred dimensions, maybe they'd like to help create a place where representations of those sacred dimensions can be honored and can be shown like a, with the respect in a museum-like setting, not just at a festival. Not but just at, temporary. But and not just temporary on the playa for a minute, but bring it a, a, a respectful place where we can look at these visions and think about what is this? What is this world that, uh, that is really sending us messages of hope and messages of unity? You know, in a world that's divided, I think of the visionary artist as the, you know, small voice of conscience and consciousness uh, in the media flow. Maybe that sounds, you know, highfalutin or something, but... 
you know, at least that's the aspiration. A lot of the artists aim for uh, being as clear as they can to the mysteries that they've experienced. Mm. So, so we're about at the end of this interview segment, and I just want to make sure that uh, our listeners have a chance to um, know how to connect with you and to participate in the co-creation of Entheon because we have such an awesome international tribe, and I'm sure there's lots of people that would love to get involved. So how can how can Here's they- the easy way to, until uh, June 1st, you can go to buildentheon.com to find out about our Kickstarter and join into our Kickstarter. Buildentheon.com will remain there and it will always give you updates on how the build is going. We have uh, It's amazing to see the inside. So if you log on to buildentheon.com, you can see some pictures of what's going on right now at Entheon because we are in the process of building. We need $300,000 to finish the interior and open the exhibition. Now, uh, you can... Contact Alex and I and find out about COSM, Chapel of Sacred Mirrors here in the Hudson Valley, at COSM, C-O-S-M dot O-R-G dot org, because COSM stands for Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. Here we are. We have tons of events. We have a, Alex and I are so accessible. If you'd like to study with us, we're teaching uh, a wonderful class this summer. It's our 27th summer of teaching the five-day visionary art intensive, and most of the artists we know. We know through that class, we've just met so many great artists there. So come join us at the, at the uh, you, can, you can find at it's, Omega, it's at Omega Institute. Institute. And you can find out about our five-day visionary art intensive at theomega.org. Now, do you have to be an experienced artist to participate in this, or can you be a total beginner? Artists at any level of ability and experience. That's what we want at this five-day visionary art intensive, which really focuses on How do we attract images? How do we get them? How do we get them? How do we keep them in there? And how do we get them out? You know, what we we come up with all different kinds of methods for that some are good for some people and others better for others, so that you can have a range of ways of finding the way to get those images out in the world through your own sacred symbols, your own personal sacred symbols. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, I would love to be able to do that one day. So, got to look at my timeline, but it's Come so great. No. Thank you. No.